Welcome to the Cambridge Neuroscience Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. This series features current work from across the schools and departments of the University of Cambridge, reflecting the pioneering work and diverse interests of members of Cambridge Neuroscience. Cambridge Neuroscience is currently going through quite a detailed consultation process to develop six new themes for the research we do here. Each of the next 12 talks will come from one of the six new themes, two from each. For more info on the themes and the talks covered in this series, please follow the links below and follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro. Today we are delighted to welcome Dr. Amy Orban. Amy is a research fellow at Emmanuel College and a research fellow at the MRC Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit. Amy's research uses large-scale data to examine how digital technologies affect adolescent psychological well-being and mental health. Welcome, Amy. Great, thank you, and thanks for joining everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be presenting at Cambridge Neurosciences. Um, a challenge and a pleasure, really. So. Just to give a bit of an overview how I approach this talk is um, this is kind of it, the talk is pretty much completely new. I've taken some slides from various different talks I've given across the years, but my hope is that this talk will actually I, I, I wrote it to speak to a broad neuroscience community to make the case <laughs> for studying technology use as part of our work more routinely. And so this is really the case I want to make throughout this talk is that understanding the digital isn't just a separate research area where people like me kind of spend their whole career just focusing on what digital communication means or what the effects of certain digital technologies are, but that digital communication is now so central to human life um, and life of many different kind of people around the world that we need to study it in a, in a different and more integrated perspective. To do this, I need to cover a broad range of different um, perspectives to the topic. So, and to do so, I'll cover, I'll, I'm going to split my talk into three quite separate parts. So in the first part, I'll talk about the past. And by talking about the past, I'm going to talk about um, how technological concerns or, or our scientific conversation around new technologies has been shaped and how it still shapes how we talk about technologies today. Then I'll talk about the present, which is where I'll talk about what we currently know specifically about social media use and well-being and mental health in adolescents. And then I'll talk a bit about the future. So how can we research technologies and neuroscience and cognition and behavior in a more integrated way? So I'll be building up to the arguments that I will be presenting you in the future section. So I hope this will talk to a very broad audience, even though some of these, some of the parts of this talk will be focused on very specific research questions. Okay, sorry, I'm having trouble with my slides. There we go. Let's start with the past. Um, and I start with the past because often talks about technologies don't start with the past, but they start with now. You know, we, we're having behavior change that's going on now. People are using more technologies of a certain kind, and this is urgent because they might be changing how we live our lives or, or how we develop or how we feel. But to really have an academic view on this subject, we need to understand the past and how people have approached new technologies um, throughout the past decades and centuries. And that's because concerns about technologies are very routinely found, even if we go back to the ancient Greeks, where um, he, there have been historians saying that Aristotle was very concerned about that writing would be causing a decline in the intellect of Greek society. Um, and just in the last couple of hundred years, we've had real concern about different technologies causing problematic changes to individuals in our society. And often these individuals are, um, not the power holders of society. It might be women, it might be children or young people. So those who might not control public conversation. So in, so we've had concerns about bicycles. There are some really nice New York Times articles about experts in neuroscience showing that bicycle use changes the shape of our brains and this will change the attention span and drive women insane. We had concerns about the radio in the 1940s that most teens and young people are addicted to the radio, something that I'll talk a bit about 
in the next couple of minutes. But then also in the 1950s, there were concerns about comic books causing teenage aggression and actually quite restrictive comic book legislation was passed uh, in America to address this. With television um, in the 1950s and 60s, the UK government started investing huge amounts of research into understanding how television was changing the attention span and the well-being of children, especially the children in Norfolk, because they actually the, the household television was rolled out last in rural Norfolk. And so they actually had some really nicely designed studies there. Um, and in the last couple of decades, we've had concerns about video games uh, and concerns about smartphones and social media really shaping a, a big part of uh, at least the scientific literature that I inhabit. So concerns about technologies have been omnipresent and they're often about populations that are not power holders in society. And I'll focus mainly on adolescents and children in this talk, but there are others like women or immigrants that have been focused, the focus of technological concerns as well. And incoming new technologies are often linked to problems in society that seem to also be very much present over long periods of time. So for example, youth violence or, or youth, um, youth misbehaving has been a problem for many, many decades. And one could argue it was maybe just a problem that has always been uh, highlighted by human societies. However, these issues are often linked to new technologies or media emerging. So in 1954, Friedrich Wertham wrote a book saying that comic books were leading to this recent increase in youth violence. And so restrictive legislation would need to control what was being displayed in comic books. In uh, 1988, there was a media task force in the US because there was a spike in youth violence and they found that television viewing, like watching movies like Spider-Man would influence or, or promote youths becoming violent. And naturally not last year because we were all pretty much constrained to our houses, but the year before there was this spikes in knife crime on the streets of London, often from teenage populations and the press, um, routinely blamed social media or YouTube or grime music for this as well. So not only do concerns about media emerge, they're often linked to other trends in society um, that people want an explanation for, like youth violence, um, like changing attention spans or, you know, worries about child development. So one example of this is the radio. And I just wanted to focus on that as one example of a technology, a technology in the past that could help us understand what we have today, what we're reacting to today. And so in 1941, Mary Preston was a pediatrician working out of San Francisco and Stanford in California. And she studied about 117 children to look how they reacted to both radio dramas and dramas in movie theaters. So naturally in the 1940s, there was no home television. And so the new technologies were going to the movies and listening to the radio. And she found that the vast majority of these 117 children in her study was severely addicted to the radio. Um, she found that these terrifying scenes can have an inhibitory effect on the functioning of every organ in the body and that most of these young people and children who are addicted utilize this addiction as an escape from reality, much as a chronic alcoholic does drink. Why I choose this is I think there's a huge amount of overlap with the conversation we're having in society today with social media and children and teenagers, talking about addictive tendencies, talking about relating it to drug use, and worrying about what using this technology means for general developmental processes and biological processes. And so we're not alone in worrying um, about what a new technology means for us. You know, we've, we're joined by many generations of academics and, and just humans and the public trying to make sense of these changes. For example, there's some really nice quotes about the radio, which I think you could more or less transpose to today to talk about social media and nobody would think it's out of place. For example, the director of the Child Study Association of America in 1935 said that about the radio, no locks will keep this intruder out, nor can parents shift their children away from it. Similarly, um, in 1939, uh, this is a quote from a parenting magazine. 
where they said that here is a device that is everywhere. We may question the quality of its offering for our children. We may approve or deplore its entertainments and enchantments, but we are powerless to shut it out. It comes into our very homes and captures our children before our very eyes. So again, you, I feel like I could write this now about social media and it would echo a lot of these concerns harbored by parents and policymakers in this space. Um, similar to articles like these um, where giving your child a smartphone is likened to giving them a gram of cocaine. So this leaves us with some interesting um, developments which we need to understand from the past to actually understand what we're dealing with today. And one of the things about the radio is that in the 1940s, when Mary Preston wrote her article saying that most of her, the children she studied were addicted to the radio, was that 1940s was a culmination of a rapid change in how the radio was part of American households. So you can see in the data on the right that the percentage of US households with at least one radio increased from about 40% in the 1930s to about 80% in the 1940s. In the 1940s, children were spending about one to three hours a day listening to the radio. And so we have actually a major so well, a major change in how people spend their time and how children spend their time. And this seems to be leading to these concerns. <clears throat> Sorry. So let me just take a so what we know by looking at the past is that there seem to be these cycles of concern about technologies. They seem to be driven by um, when a technology reaches a certain threshold of popularity in society, they're often directed at those who are not power holders in society, like children, young people. And they're often linked to other trends in society, like spikes in youth violence, decreases in well-being, or um, changes in health, for example. So, now we're going to leave that chapter of the past behind us and think about the present. But to do so, we need to think about, you know, is, are we now just like the radio? You know, are the people going to laugh about my research in 30 or 40 years thinking it was a bit ridiculous? Or are we in a point in time where actually researching technologies has kind of additional importance? And I, I do argue that the latter is the case. I don't think that, well, technologies now are much more immersive than they were in the 1940s, for example. Our children are spending, at the moment, at least most of their days in front of technologies. Um, technological platforms are real infrastructures in society that determine how we communicate and how we interact. And for example, how Zoom is set up or how a social media platform is set up can really change our experience of humanity at the moment, at least in COVID, but also when we move out of the lockdown state, technologies are ever evolving and ever more integrated into our lives. And so I think it's not out of place to be asking questions around technologies and integrating them into our areas of study in, in the neurosciences, whether that will be kind of what I study, which is mainly this kind of questionnaire based mental health, or if we're working more in the cognitive development or biological space. And so the rest of this, this part of the talk of the present, I'll talk a bit about my own work. So what we know about teens and social media and the approaches and, and the lessons that I've learned in this space. And then in the future section, I'll talk a lot more about how this then, what we can improve and how we can really integrate a study of technology into the more integrative study of neurosciences here at Cambridge or beyond. But let's focus on the present first. So I'll be covering three areas where we, what, of what we kind of know about social media use and, and well-being and mental health in teens to show you some of the general themes that emerge. The first is that if we look at a correlational data set, um, so if we ask adolescents to report on their mental health, maybe ask them um, how they're feeling at a specific day or in general, and we also ask them how much they use certain technologies like social media, we would expect to find a very small negative correlation between the two. So adolescents who report more social media use are also those adolescents who report slightly lower mental health than those who might report lower social media use. Um, I hope I said that right. 
I'll just repeat it. <laughs> so those who report higher social media use report lower mental health. Um, so that is what has driven a lot of the media debate in the space for many, many years. We somehow not moved on from the correlational nature of these negative relationships a lot. Um, and, but they are pretty robust. So reviews has found that in most surveys, if we look at young adolescents, we find this small negative relationship. And actually, I, I designed this talk, talk to be mainly for an academic audience. And a lot of us got kind of beaten into us during our education that correlation does not mean causation. So yes, there might be a small negative correlation between social media use and mental health in adolescence, but it could well, well, there could be in general, three different drivers of this. So it could be that social media use actually causes a decrease in mental health. It could be that having lower mental health causes you to use more social media, or it could be that a third factor affects both social media and mental health, and they're actually unrelated. So that could be, for example, socioeconomic status. We know, for example, in the US that those adolescents in, in households of lower socioeconomic status use more technologies and that they also report lower mental health. And so that could be a reason why we find this negative relationship without no, even though there's no causal relationship between the two. Okay, so we now have this correlation and it's important to note here that it's very small in size. Um, in a work of mine from 2019, we found that the correlation between wearing glasses and well-being for teenagers was more negative than the relation between social media use and well-being in teenagers. This isn't, I think this only helps serve as a kind of visualization about one, that correlations don't tell us a lot, and two, that we need to think about effect size if we're, for example, calling for large-scale policy change um, for doing something different for social media, if we're not doing the same for wearing glasses, if it's working off the same sort of correlation. Um, so moving on from these correlations, there's been quite a bit of observational or experimental work. So for example, there have been experiments where people do certain detoxes of certain social media platforms like Facebook, and that have then tracked well-being over time. A lot of these studies find mixed effects. So one very high quality study found that well-being increased, but on a daily level, well-being was unchanged. Um, another study found that Cortisol decreased during a um, Facebook detox, so the stress hormone went down, but actually um, life satisfaction decreased as well. So there's kind of mixed responses in that. And there's been large scale longitudinal observational work, which allows us to um, look at kind of longer term effects um, and kind of go, going away from the correlations themselves. And I'll talk a bit more about them now. That's because longitudinal data sets, so data sets that I really enjoy working with and that I work with on an almost daily basis, allow us to look at directional links. So the default argument for social media affecting mental health in teenagers is just that, that there's a one-way street between social media use leading to a decrease in adolescent mental health. But naturally, as I said before on the previous slide, it could also be that a decrease in mental health leads to an increase in social media use, or it could be a third factor that relates to both, which causes a relationship to be there without a clear causal link between the two being established. So there have been many different ways of approaching this question on different time frames in this space. But what they mainly find is that the directional links are unclear. So um, they either find that there are two-way linkages, so it's kind of a two-way street, so that social media use predicts a slight decrease in mental health, but that a decrease in mental health also it predicts an increase in social media use, or they find that only one of those uh, links are there, or they find none, so very mixed effects again. For example, um, work that I did with colleagues um, in Vienna and Oxford in 2019 looked at a data set of 12,600 adolescents between the ages of 10 and 15. And we used a longitudinal modeling technique called random intercept cross-site panel models to link those two bidirectionally on, on the person level. 
So what we found is that if an individual increased their social media use in one year, that predicted a slight decrease in life satisfaction one year later. But we also found that if an individual's life satisfaction decreased in one year, that predicted an increase in social media use one year later. And for that, we use, I think, six or seven waves of data. So seven years worth of data that was being collected on these adolescents. And so those show us that there might well be bidirectional links between the two, or probably that there's even more causal um, complex relationships that might not be, might be nonlinear, might, you know, have loads more factors influencing this. So I think even this bidirectional pathway model is a probably a gross oversimplification of the things we're actually trying to study. Michaeline Jensen and her colleagues, including Candice Odgers, did a really nice study also in around 2019 when they tracked, about, I think, about 400 adolescents in North Carolina. And they didn't only track them over years, so that's what the study that I did looked at, but they also tracked them on the day level. So looking at whether a change in social media use on one day predicted a change in well-being on the next day. And again, they found very little evidence of these linkages there. So the third factor I wanted to focus on in this talk is that individual differences matter. So what I, the last two themes about the present is firstly that, you know, correlations don't tell us much, <laughs> um, but they drive a lot of the media debate. The second is that probably their bi-directional relationship between social media and mental health or well-being, and probably they're even more complicated than that. And now I want to complicate that even further to say that differences really matter. So there might be certain types of users that are negatively affected while some types of users are positively affected. And that could be due to themselves as a person, so kind of person level differences, or in how they use the media, so media level differences. For example, a recent work coming out of the University of Amsterdam found that 44% of their adolescent sample of I think about 300 adolescents um, didn't feel better or worse after using social media, while 46% felt better and 10% felt worse, showing that there's clear heterogeneity in this space and we need to start really caring about these individual differences because we cannot make blanket statements about how social media affects the whole <laughs> of population of adolescents, for example. The first type of work that has and been done in individual differences has been to split on gender, which is probably the most simplest um, split you can do in terms of individual differences, but it's often a proxy for other social um, factors. So I'm not saying that all these effects are driven by gender. It's just that gender is a dichotomous, well, in our data set at the moment, it's, it's a dichotomous variable that's being collected. And so we can split that and, and have a look. And what this work often finds is that teenage girls show a stronger bi-directional relationship between social media use and life satisfaction than their male counterparts. For example, going back to the study on 12,600 adolescents in the UK, this, is, um, this graph shows how social media use is linked to life satisfaction in teenage girls between the ages of 10 and 15. And every row is a different facet of life satisfaction, ranging from schoolwork and school to satisfaction with friends and family and appearance. And the black dots are the mean of that prediction of social media use predicting a change in life satisfaction. And we see that most of these are below zero and the confidence intervals don't overlap with the zero axis, showing that these would we would call statistically significant effects. However, if we now look at the male counterparts, um, the graph will move towards that direction of how the males look. And we see that the effects become a lot smaller and they overlap a lot more with zero, showing that actually we're a lot worse at predicting life satisfaction from social media use in teenage boys. We can do the same the other way around. So whether we can predict social media use from life satisfaction one year prior, and again, this is for teenage girls, and for teenage boys, we see a much smaller kind of, well, 
everything is non-significant there. We cannot predict um, a change in social media use from a change in life satisfaction one year before. So, um, and this has been replicated in many different data sets where it does seem that teenage girls are those that seem to struggle most. That's often what the, the messaging around that is. There's a study in review at the moment with, that I've worked with colleagues here at Cambridge where we actually looked at age as well. So um, often we lump all adolescents together, whether they're 10 or 20 or 18 or 16. But adolescence is a really long period of development with core stages of different developments occurring. And so we would often, well, we would almost not predict that social media will have an equal effect across the adolescent age range um, in the study, yeah, or the age range over the whole lifespan. And so this is a study, as I said, under review, where we actually looked at participants all the way from age 10 to age 80. And these are about 84,000 UK participants. Um, and we, this is just the correlations again. So we're going back to correlations between social media use on the x-axis and satisfaction with life on the y-axis. In blue, we have males and in red, we have females. So here I only present data from the 16 to 25 year olds. So we would almost say this is older adolescents or young adulthood. And we see um, these inverse U-shaped relationships. And these have been found throughout the literature in terms of social media use and, and well-being. It's that those uh, young adults who use the most or the least social media seem to be scoring lower on satisfaction with life questions than those who use maybe one hour or two hours a day. So in the middle of this scale. But we can look at how this develops in other areas, well, other ages of life. So for example, at age 10 and 11 or at in when you're 60 or 70. And here we see more negative correlations there, but the confidence intervals are very, very wide. Okay, now I can move my cursor. Um, so they extend a kind of from very negative to kind of very high here and there as well in the 60s and 70s. And that's because very few participants when they're age 10 or 11 or 60 or 70 use many hours of social media use a day. And so we're very uncertain about what the relationship is at these very high levels of social media use. And so these are not very helpful for us to actually understand the correlation at those ages. If we look at ages 26 to about 50s, um, we see almost something similar to the inverted U shape in young adulthood, except that there is a bit more uncertainty at the higher levels of social media use. But most interestingly, in young adolescents, we start seeing a very different pattern. And this is what I show here. So again, to recap, in blue, we have adolescent, well, males, and in red, we have females. And what we, we see is that adolescent females start showing a very negative correlation between social media use and life satisfaction in early adolescence, while the male counterparts show a pretty level relationship that then becomes more negative at around 15 or 16. And so this shows us that, you know, the correlations again don't tell us a lot. They only can give us an indication where something interesting might be occurring, but we can then use longitudinal data to target these specific age ranges and gender differences and have a look what's going on. And so the, the nice thing about this data is that we had annual longitudinal data for ages 10 to 21. And if we look at just 10 to 21 year olds and look at how social media use predicts life satisfaction. So we're now looking longitudinally again <laughs> um, for males. We see this happening across the time frame of adolescence. So at ages 10 to 13, the confidence intervals, which the 95% confidence intervals are the dark blue, we see it overlaps with the zero axis. And so there's social media use in one year doesn't significantly predict life satisfaction in the next year. And that's similarly the case at age 16 to 18. However, at ages 14 and 15 and at ages 19, we see that it 
drops below zero. And so here, statistically, we can predict um, a small decrease in life satisfaction if there was an increase in social media use the year before. And so this, sh this shows us really nicely that there seems to be specific times in adolescence here for teenage boys where the sensitivity to social media might be increasing. So we can do the same for teenage girls and compare. So now teenage girls are at the top and differently to teenage boys, the time when they, when they show a negative link between social media use and life satisfaction is early in adolescence, age 10 to 13. And then they again show this drop at age 19. So the question is, why do we see these fluctuations? Uh, what might be driving them? And we will definitely need to do more research to actually know for certain, but the gender differences might show us something interesting going on. So at age 19, we see a very equal drop for both females and males, while in the earlier adolescent age range, we see the drop earlier in girls than boys. And girls go through puberty earlier than boys, or a certain aspect of pubertal development happened before boys. And so it could be that these early um, increases in sensitivity to social media might be driven by pubertal changes, for example, in how people self-perceive themselves or how they perceive their peers, while this later drop or in, in kind of social media use predicting life satisfaction significantly could be due to social changes that affect all adolescents similarly. For example, um, the social ruptures that happen when people graduate school, go to work or university or further education. But this is really just opens up many new questions <laughs> than provides answers. So we've talked about gender and age as an individual difference. I just want to quickly touch on a couple more. So the first is approaches to social media. So people might be using social media differently or for different things, and that might well matter a lot. Uh, data from NHS Digital that Tamsin Ford here works at Cambridge um, helped collect, showed that for just on the right-hand side here, we see um, 11 to 19 year old boys and girls that either have a mental disorder diagnosed or do not have a mental disorder diagnosed and who and it shows a percentage of whom say they compare themselves to others on social media and so we see that for teenage girls about half of social media users who have a mental disorder say they actively compare themselves on social media while it's only a third for those that don't have a mental disorder while it's equal for boys. So this might be showing us that it's not just how much you use social media, but also what you use it for, how you use it, do you compare yourself, etc. And this is really important to study further. Lastly, we need to think about things like deprivation um, and other individual differences that might well be way more important than gender or age and that we haven't studied yet to their full capacity. But I think for now, we need to leave the present behind us and look quickly towards the future. That's because I feel like while all of these results are interesting and I'm, I'm proud of the work that the field has done and, and I wouldn't be working in this if I don't find like we're progressing, I feel like there's so much more potential to actually understanding how digital fits into general neurosciences and, and the understanding we develop as very different researchers. And so I'm going to argue that actually in the next 10 or 20 years, we will see an integrated cognitive and developmental or biological <laughs> study of social media. And this is a very grand vision. Um, and I will try to make it more concrete by talking specifically about adolescence, mainly because I know this better and because it's been the focus of this talk. So adolescence is a time of both biological, psychological, and social change. Um, main, you know, if we need to distill three broad categories. And each of these changes that we have studied uh, very successfully has a real interface with digital communication or social media use in the 21st century that I think could be scoped out in a much more concrete and scientific way than they have currently. And I'll go through each in turn. So for example, 
there's, there's great work here done at the University of Cambridge um, and previously at UCL by Sarah Jane Blakehorn's group um, on the development of the social brain in adolescence, making adolescence a sensitive period for social development, for self-perception and social interaction. So adolescents become a lot more prone to seeing themselves as kind of judging themselves in terms of how other people see themselves, for example, or they become a lot more influenced by peers in doing so. And this can be seen as rooted in biological changes that happen in adolescence as a separate period of life where big developments are taking place. So how do, this, how do these biological changes interface with social media, for example? And I think there are very clear overlaps. Social media, for example, allows teenagers to curate profiles of themselves to the world or to their peers. Many teenagers now actually don't have just one profile on, for example, Instagram, but multiple, where they test out different ways of portraying themselves to others. They also have a quantifiable feedback to that self-presentation. So for example, if I'm posting selfies or posts, I can really get a quantifiable feedback on how people react to me and how I present myself online. Further, I can make contact to much greater amount of people than in my physical surrounding. For example, I can contact people around the world, but also those people in my school, you know, when I go home, I can still contact them there. So a lot of these developments we've studied very carefully in the biological domain of adolescence actually are, are either challenged or enhanced or questioned by these current developments on digital platforms and social media. Next, let's think about psychological changes. Um, adolescence is a time of cognitive development. There's changes to emotional regulation or planning or response inhibition. And again, there are clear overlaps with questions around social media. For example, social media has been shown to challenge self-regulation. For example, studies have shown that with fear of missing out, um, that people who fear more that they're missing out of something on social media. They also use more social media. And there's a lot of public discourse around the challenges of inhibiting social media use. So this links really nicely with a time of life when we know there are changes to feedback sensitivity or response inhibition. And so again, this is somewhere where we could study this in a lot more systematic way. Lastly, adolescence is a time of major social change. Social cultural changes span from going from school to university or work to um, it, you know, peers becoming anthropologically more important because of looking for mates um, to peer relationships becoming more important. So there is a lot of work in this space of social change. And there again, social media really changes how young people can communicate. For example, if we focus on the move from school to university or work, social media now allows you to make new friends, but also stay in touch with old ones, which can change the social dynamic quite massively um, for young people. And there's been some really nice qualitative work in this area about moving to university and the pressures of that, um, how they might be magnified by social media. So what I would argue is that technologies really sit in the 21st century <laughs> of the study of adolescence, they sit alongside these biological, psychological, and social factors. And they don't just sit alongside them. I feel like they all overlap quite substantially. And so I don't think it's worthwhile to kind of study each of these blobs in isolation. I think we could really magnify it by studying these overlaps um, as groups of academics in places like Cambridge. Understanding technologies and what I would say is kind of 21st century developmental and, and neuroscience um, allows you to kind of do two things. So the first is to study new questions in old ways. Um, and this is a gross oversimplification, but these are kind of these new overlaps, for example, and we can use the method that we've already developed over many decades to study these questions and shed light on uh, digital communication. So for example, this is a task that was delivered in 2017 by Rodman and colleagues, where they looked at, they tested adolescents predicted acceptance by random people 
by displaying them kind of a face of a person and asking them, how much do you think this person will like you? <laughs> um, and you can see that predicted acceptance really decreases in early adolescence between the ages of 11 and 16, while it goes back to about 60% acceptance at, um, in young adulthood. And so combining such a cognitive task to studying how social media affects a teenager could give us really interesting information. For example, do those who, who show this cognitive decrease in predicted acceptance by others show a more nervous pattern of social media use or show more negative impacts of their social media use, for example? Further, there are neuroimaging studies, for example, like these, where um, you look at reward activity in the brain um, due to certain learning tasks and you can measure um, these reward sensitivity in the brain. And again, there are certain spikes in at certain ages in adolescence. So again, you could come, if we're looking at reward sensitivity or the compulsive use of social media, this is a really nice intersection where we could build full on research projects, <laughs> um, measuring this brain reaction to reward sensitivity and then looking maybe on a device level, on a daily level, how people are using social media and how that might predict how they're feeling. So we can study these, what I would say, new questions in old ways, but we can also study old questions in new ways. And I just quickly wanted to kind of use as an example, a study uh, that Sarah Jane Blakemore, Roger Kivett and Olivia Tomova and I recently got funded by the Jacobs Foundation, which uses the sensors on the phone to actually collect valuable data about adolescents so that we don't need to ask them about things, but the, the phone can collect really valuable clinical or psychological data. I don't really have time, but the app that we're going to use looks a bit like this. This is the EARS app. And the EARS app allows, so using digital means of data collection, we can not only look at how much a smartphone is being used, but also what Kind of are people typing during the use? Are they moving? Because smartphones have very sophisticated accelerometers and movement um, systems, or we can infer sleep by looking at light sensing and charging routines. And so while maybe digital questions are not interesting to some of us here at Cambridge Neurosciences, I think using digital means to collect data is of core interest to many of us when we start planning you know, big studies in the 21st century. So what I think I've, I've covered is that technologies really sit on the intersection of a lot of modern research in both development, cognition, clinical, behavior, biological, or social. And they intersect with many in very important and innovative ways. However, um, and, and this is where I really enjoy working <laughs> with technologies and these questions around technologies, they come with many interesting challenges that we need to consider as well. So if we use them for data collection, we need to have expertise in, in developing these data collection mechanisms and understanding what we can harvest from uh, digital data. And I'm currently working on digital donation as a mechanism to do so in a kind of very innovative way. We also need to build the infrastructure for many researchers to do this sort of work um, and there a lot of funders are becoming increasingly interested both in the medical and social domain to funding this large scale infrastructure. We also need to think about the policy angle and, and continue talking with people with lived experience like teenagers, <laughs> because I, I tell you, I'm always surprised when I talk to a teenager about their use. I learn many new things <laughs> about things I didn't realize they were doing online. We need to think about the populations we study. Um, I work with a PhD student at the moment looking at um, both populations in the global north, but also in the global south, and that the questions we study will be very different for these populations. We need to think about industry and knowledge exchange. We need to think about theory, statistics, and how we do things openly and transparently. And so this is really kind of the puzzle I think we need to solve if we want to study technologies and the neurosciences in a real 21st century framework. So I hope I've convinced you <laughs> at least partially of this future um, manifesto of mine, but I'd love to answer any questions 
Um, and also naturally a lot of this was ideas, just me throwing ideas out there. So I'm always happy to answer emails or have calls or chats if you're interested in doing any of this work in this space. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for that timely and engaging discussion. If you wish, you can follow Amy on Twitter at Orban Amy. So don't forget to join us next week when we will welcome Dr. Jing Reng from the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology here in Cambridge. Jing is a junior group leader at the MRC LMB since January 2020, and currently her team is working on revealing the development assembly of the serotonin system. You can sign up here on the link shown below, and you can follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro to keep up to date. See you next time.